you know, I, I had the opportunity to hear some of the stuff that's been going on today, and I was a little bit worried that maybe I wouldn't apply, you know, that I, I would sort of be off to left field, but I've, I'm shocked to realize that what I'm going to talk about applies very di directly to what people were talking about. There was a real emphasis in uh, the art of keeping a story simple, the art of being clear. And so tonight I'm going to talk about the power, the power of the obvious. Um, and I know that sounds a little bit strange, um, uh, what is obvious, but here I'm going to show you a little bit. Um, uh, I myself as a filmmaker was called uh, many times a, a master uh, of the obvious, uh, which I was really proud of for a while until I found out that actually that's kind of a derogatory expression. It actually usually means that you're a, you're a bit thick. Um, and uh, actually that is a picture of me. Um, so, uh, I probably guess that you know this guy. This is uh, Captain Obvious. Uh, and I'm not, I don't work for Hotels.com, but Captain Obvious to me is an amazing kind of phenomena because he was actually invented by the internet. He was kind of a crowdsourced creation. A lot of people don't know this. Uh, he, he, he began as a, a kind of cartoon character, Captain Obvious. Uh, he also, um, uh, uh, he, he, he was like a popular meme. Uh, here's an example of, of the meme. Uh, and uh, as well, um, uh, I asked the question, you know, a very good sort of demanding question to ask in every situation I find is, what would Captain Obvious do? And I find it might apply to some of the projects uh, that have been pitched so far in this uh, amazing event. So, uh, I myself have a lot of experience with barriers to innovation. I think that I'll explain. I'm just going to go back, uh, maybe like the last speaker, into a little bit of my career, uh, only because it sort of relates uh, directly. Uh, and uh, my, my career as a filmmaker was really launched uh, in dealing with kind of obvious barriers. Uh, and uh, this actually relates directly, as somebody has mentioned before, that we're on indigenous land here, probably in some cases Mohawk land. Uh, and I, as a reporter, I started off, one of the first things I did as a reporter uh, is I was at the Oka crisis. Uh, and um, I, I don't know if you remember, you have to be kind of a little bit older to remember, but during the Oka crisis, all the TV cameras got pulled out at a key moment. So for the people that don't know, this was a standoff between the Canadian Army the Sûreté de Québec, the police in Quebec, and Mohawk natives uh, in Oka who didn't want a golf course to be built uh, on their um, uh, ancestral uh, cemetery. Anyway, to so make a long story short, it turned into a big sort of military confrontation. All the TV cameras got pulled out, uh, and then a very strange thing happened. Basically, myself and a, another photographer were able to get a camera behind the lines. And the story is sort of be best told by the... Uh, uh, an NFB documentary, and you'll see kind of a weird side to it. Uh, so this is a short clip from the NFB documentary, and it explains a bit how we got in. But the actual twist about how we really got in is, is, is a different story. So I'll explain that to you in a second. Do we have volume? Sorry, I'm going to play it again. Looking for sound. There we go, you can turn it up. Major Alain Tremblay is in charge of this maneuver. How many times have they kept one, one promise? That's what they we kept have one promise. Do. One promise they kept. They, they promised to take all of our land, and they're doing it. Myself and uh, Robert Galbraith, we. Um, when we heard there was no TV cameras here and that uh, people were concerned that a massacre might happen because it wouldn't be televised, um, we took a small video camera, this one, and we put it in a box and we uh, crawled through the forest, uh, mostly on our bellies, got covered with insects, and we went past the army in broad daylight. Qu'est-ce que vous savez sur les deux journalistes qui ont réussi à franchir vos lignes? C'est vous qui l'avez dit, mais en tant qu'on est concerné, il n'y a pas personne qui a passé à travers euh, notre périmètre. Euh... You didn't see us. À notre avis, c'est des journalistes qui étaient là depuis le début, tout simplement. Le Major Tremblay nous l'a confirmé tantôt. Je ne crois pas que le Major Tremblay vous ait confirmé que personne n'est passé au père. Comment vous expliquez qu'il y a deux journalistes qui ont réussi à pénétrer dans le périmètre? Très bonne question. C'est des gens qui sont euh, très agiles. Il y a tout ce psychologique sur le fait que vous ne pouvez pas passer par le barbe. Nous avons mis un tarpaulin sous le barbe, au lieu de passer au-dessus, et nous avons crawlé au-dessus. 
and came through about 7.30, this is last Sunday. We're your eyes and they're trying to blind us by getting the press out of here. And I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to be blinded. I want you to see, I want the people to see what's going to happen. I can't understand why the, the politicians don't realize this, that there's going to be complete anarchy throughout Canada if, if anybody's hurt here. It's beautiful up here. It's really nice. Okay, let me... Let me. And, um, the people are really great. And I recommend it to anyone. So I should explain, um, part of the twist here is that uh, the Army had erected 30-foot razor wire walls in, around the entire perimeter. And that's why they were so confident that nobody had gotten through. And I did, uh, I, I did explain it a little bit, but uh, the amazing thing was when we arrived at the wall, we actually didn't know what we were going to do. We looked up this 30-foot wall of razor wire. If you know razor wire, I, I wouldn't... Uh, so we would, we, at that time, we didn't ask what would ca Captain Obvious do, but in this case, it really mattered. Razor wire, if you try to climb it, it hooks into your skin. That's what it's designed for. And what we actually did is we just lifted up the fence and we went underneath it. And that lesson uh, has, sorry, has, has stuck with me for the rest of my life, that a lot of huge barriers in life are entirely psychological. Uh, and this was sort of a dramatic example. Now, the Oka crisis ended, uh, and although there was some violence when it ended, uh, as uh, these kind of things go, it was a, a rather uh, peaceful ending uh, on, on some levels, uh, and possibly due to the presence of TV cra cameras, strangely enough. Um, I should point out that, uh, that right now, in that same area, there is tremendous uh, flooding. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually me in Pierrefonds, Quebec, uh, just two days ago. Uh, there's flooding, and I understand there's even a flood warning for Prince Edward County uh, right now. Uh, and uh, the army is back in that area. This is the army back in the area. Uh, and amazingly, um, uh, intriguingly, uh, they're there in, in much more peaceful circumstances. They're actually doing uh, really, really uh, wonderful work. And actually, seeing as we're fort here at Fort Henry, uh, it might be nice if we did have a round of applause and salute for the work that the Canadian forces are doing with the flood, uh, floods that are going on all around us right now. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, um, uh, back to the question of the obvious, is that there's a phenomenon where people miss something that is happening right in front of them. It's a very, very intriguing phenomena, and it's uh, interesting to try to explain. Uh, in my experience, uh, one of my first films was done on stupidity. And the reason I was able to get finance was financed by the documentary channel uh, was because it was the first documentary ever made on human stupidity, which itself would seem stupid. Uh, and I, I would say it's kind of um, a scandal on some level. But um, what's interesting about stupidity and what, as a subject is that I think you would think a film on stupidity would be about you know, people that are dumb or people that have their brains have problems. But in fact, that's not what it was about. Um, the film is actually about another phenomena, deliberate stupidity. Uh, in fact, deliberate stupidity is a much more scandalous and maybe shocking and intriguing phenomena. Uh, we discovered that we live in a culture on so many levels that promotes uh, stupidity on, dramatic, on a dramatic level, and it has led to the ascendance of a class, in a sense, that promotes ignorance and stupidity. And I can give you one very clear, well-known example, uh, this guy. But we are currently living with a much more even dramatic uh, example, which is this guy. Um, in fact, you might be interested to know there's a poll. I just included it today. I saw it today. There's a poll where they ask people, what, came to, uh, what was the first thing that came to mind when you thought about Donald Trump? And I don't know if you can see it there, but it basically says 39% of people said the first word that came to mind was idiot. Second word that came to mind is incompetent. Third word that came to mind is liar. And this is a, this is a poll of Americans in general. And, and the fourth was leader. So leader was fourth. So very revealing. Uh, so anyways, next documentary I made, I made a, bit, a documentary about boredom. Very similar phenomena with boredom is that we discovered that boredom is not essentially what it seems. Uh, there's very few films or investigations of boredom, even though you could find that almost everybody complains about boredom. It's an experience that we all have. Uh, and what was shocking about uh, the film is that we discovered in the film that boredom is actually a stress condition. It's something that actually makes people stressed. Uh, and there's now science that demonstrates this in the blood. Uh, the next um, film was a very controversial one I made called Let's All Hate Toronto. Uh, and uh, this is also a very obvious subject if you ask 
uh, lots of Canadians, what's the thing that really concerns them the most outside of Toronto, and you will find that uh, hating Toronto, and, and this has gone down a little bit in the last few years, but lately, hating Toronto was really uh, a big deal. So now, um, uh, the next film I made was called Laughology, and this is a very similar phenomena, another subject that is hiding in plain sight. Uh, laughter is a human universal, it's everywhere, and there had never been, until this documentary was made, made a feature documentary on the subject of laughter before. So, uh, uh, laughter is a very interesting thing, and I want to perhaps explain an interesting aspect of it. Here is why nobody ever paid attention to laughter before, is that the confusion between laughter and humor is very powerful. So, here's an example of humor, uh, and humor and laughter are actually two different things, very different things. Science shows that humor probably evolved in the last 100,000 years. Laughter is probably millions of years old. Uh, and when you separate the two, you get a kind of very interesting thing. You discover that humor is an intellectual process, largely, and laughter is a health-inducing or physical process. And now we know that laughter can make you stronger, friendlier, and sexier as well. So, um, I'll give you an interesting example. Here's a clip from the film. Here's an example of somebody who really saved their life by laughing. Here's a guy who had a lot of problems, uh, was always getting beaten up when he was a kid, and he developed a very contagious, powerful laugh, and basically it saved his life. So, uh, here's a clip where he, he explains a little bit how he was discovered. They bring people out of the audience up on the stage and try to crack them up, and they make them laugh and everything. And when they brought me up there, I just, I just stole the show. <laughs> Go ahead and listen to Doug. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, this show may be over. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Colin's laughter would have an audience of hundreds in stitches for over 20 minutes. The performers walked off the stage, and after the video of the event was posted online, Colin's unique laugh became an internet sensation. Collins would soon be dubbed the man with the most contagious laugh in the world. The man who's set to have the most contagious laugh in the world is in town. The man with the most contagious laugh in the world. You claim you have the most contagious laugh on the planet. <laughs> 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 Anyways, um, when the film came out, uh, of course, uh, we wanted the film to break out, literally, uh, in that you have to market your documentary around the country or around the world, and uh, we had this sort of crazy idea, uh, which is to, ha to have laughing competitions before screenings of the film. Uh, it was like a really strange idea. I noticed that it's funny when two people laugh, almost trying to out-laugh each other, uh, and so when we did that, um, what was interesting is it actually spread. I was invited to Czech Republic, to France, to Austria, to host laughing championships uh, in many different countries. And it was really a wonderful experience, which actually I hadn't expected. Um, so here's the weirdest idea that I've got to say I worked on, or the strangest. Uh, as, as, um, as was mentioned, I, I work as a hypnotist, which I actually think is a very interesting and also strangely obvious uh, business, even though it doesn't seem that way. Uh, and one thing that's really interesting about hypnosis is that there's an old trick that hypnotists do in a stage hypnosis setting where they will actually hypnotize somebody to appear to be drunk. And so um, this is kind of a, a, a well-known, but a slightly difficult parlor trick. And I started thinking about that. It's kind of interesting. And I happened uh, to work in a while, I did workshops in a rehab where a number of people actually died of overdoses. And I was really struck, and as you know, a lot of people are dying more than ever, in fact, of drug overdoses uh, these days. And that kind of gave me an idea. So I'm not going to show you this part, um, a Captain Obvious idea. Uh, basically, I started thinking, hmm, 
maybe there's a way to actually influence people to be less obsessed with ingesting toxic amounts of substances. And so basically myself and a few friends came up with a concept called the hypnotic bar. And there's actually a documentary that explains it a little bit. And here, I'll, I'll show you a clip from it. So I started to think about an old hypnotist trick, and the hypnotists have an old parlor trick where people can actually get uh, people drunk under hypnosis. I thought that's interesting. If people could be drunk under hypnosis, maybe you could take it a little bit further, and that you can achieve altered states uh, without drugs, alcohol, or even side effects. Classic ones are we see if they can walk a straight line. They generally they can't. <laughs> we get them to touch their own noses. They cannot touch their own noses. They laugh a lot. They uh, they get maudlin too. Sometimes they get kind of sentimental. All the things that drunk people do. Except there's no hangover. That's the good part. You're so uh, yeah, no hangover, no side effects. I know a lot of you are drinking beer right now. You're probably worried about it. This way, with the hypnotic bar, absolutely no hangover, no side effects. You don't have to be rushing to the washroom all the time. It's really a, a different experience. And uh, we ju I just performed the hypnotic bar in New York City uh, st uh, to a standing room only crowd at the Alchemist Kitchen, which is a uh, popular place in downtown uh, in Manhattan. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be going back there in the fall. Uh, so it's really, I mean, when I ever explain this to people, people are like, yeah, it's a funny joke, it's a comedy show. It's not a comedy show. It's actually real. People are uh, drunk, and, and they're put on all kinds of drugs, and then they're woken up and they can drive home. It's a very weird thing. Uh, I don't recommend that they drive home, but they can. Uh, so anyways, um, uh, that's the hypnotic bar. Now, uh, I want to show you, if you don't mind, this is the film I'm working on right now. Actually, I'm working on it right now, and actually, even a scene from the film, from this, might end up in this documentary, I guess. It's possible. So, um, this documentary, I became really concerned with the idea. I believe that the next big transformational modality in life is actually acting, performing, acting. I think that you can change who you are by acting differently. I'll explain more in a second. But anyways, I became concerned with the science of how acting changes people. And then I started noticing there would be a pattern. If acting really does change people, then a lot of famous actors would probably have certain experiences. And so this uh, trailer, and this is just the trailer for the movie, uh, which is being done by the Documentary Channel and Canal Day, uh, basically is suggesting that you are what you act. So here, take a look. About to tell you sounds crazy.
that our minds change our bodies. But is it also true that, that our bodies change our minds? And the way you feel determines the way you act. Across the animal kingdom, powerful individuals adopt certain postures, and those postures are open, expansive, and they occupy space. When you assume a power stance, for two minutes, your body releases testosterone, and you feel more powerful and confident. When I tell people about this, that our bodies change our minds, and our minds can change our behavior, and our behavior can change our outcomes, they say to me, it feels fake. Don't fake it till you make it. Fake it till you become it. You were gonna fake it. Ready? <laughs> Did you go see that? Yes. Um, so uh, uh, right now, actually, so I should explain a little bit that the science behind this film has a name. The science is actually called embodied cognition. And it's a very simple idea on some level. It's the idea that there's no real separation between the body and the brain. Uh, that we live in a culture or maybe an education system that from an early age separates our brain from our body. And that this new science says that actually they're connected, which is also kind of obvious. So, if you don't mind, I would like you to maybe, if you can indulge me, and I, I'd like to demonstrate some of these exercises. So I'd like to give you an example. Uh, an example of this is uh, that uh, wearing glasses, and this is very obvious, can make you seem smarter, even though you're the same intelligence. Another example of this is that wearing sunglasses can make you look more intriguing. Uh, another weird example of this is that dressing in a lab coat improves your marks on exams. I think that's if, if you're in science. I don't think it does if you're in arts. <laughs> um, now, this is a cool one, I think. Smiling. There's now research that suggests that when you smile, even artificially, even if you just decide to smile, you change your brain chemistry to see more things to smile about. So you actually bias your brain towards finding more things to smile about by the artificial act of smiling. Does that make sense? So, I'll give you some other examples of this. So here's a thing called the gradient laugh. So this process can actually be faked. Um, and, and people always ask me this uh, too, can you fake your way to laughing? Uh, and you very much can, and I'll demonstrate this if you don't mind, if you can do this with me. I think it'll kind of warm us up, I hope. So basically what you want to do is very, very gently make a, a, a ha 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 sound, a little bit like this. You just go like this, you go ha 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 ha. Just like that, ha 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 ha. Very good. <laughs> now, the only thing is a gradient laugh is the idea is that we start low and we gradually get louder. If that's okay. We're gonna start low and gradually get louder. So, very, very quietly, as quietly as you can almost, as very quietly as you can, you just can take a deep breath in. That's very good. You're doing great already. Ha, 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 You guys are good. You're like too good. So we start very quiet like this. Ha, ha, Very good. See, real. Now you're laughing for real. So that's the idea of the gradient laugh. So now I'll give you another example. Power posing. So... That's right, there's some power poses here. Fantastic. So, wow, <laughs> professionals, that's right. Holy cow. So let me explain power posing. Power posing is an amazing theory. The theory is that people will read you as more powerful, as more influential. You'll do better at job interviews. You'll do better at public speaking if you adopt, if you take more space. So, so that, that would be like walking with big steps literally taking up more of the stage, uh, using big gestures, as opposed to small gestures where people will actually unconsciously stop paying attention to you. It's weird. So the idea is power posing can be empowering for people. Now, there is some controversy about the science, I should just mention that, but it's kind of intriguing. Now, uh, this is the victory pose. I, now, I'm just gonna ask you, actually, can we go back to the power pose? It's kind of good if we all try these things 
And then just say how you feel, either to the person next to you or to me. So try the power pose. Let me show you the technique. It's feet akimbo. It's your feet apart. It's your hands on your hips, like that. That's right. How do you feel? Now, yes, according to Amy Cuddy, psychologist at Harvard, within two minutes of assuming this posture, and this is the part that's controversial, your testosterone levels raise at a detectable level in your blood. It's kind of amazing. I actually think something's going on. It's not exactly that, but that's, there is something going on just by assuming that pose. You might be intrigued to know that certain yoga poses do the same thing. Cobra pose in yoga has a similar effect. Now, try the victory pose. So this is what whoever are the teams that are going to win, or all the teams, should do this because the idea of the victory pose is that you are, more, you are primed for winning things if you practice the victory pose. So you go, yeah, yeah, we're going to win. We're going to win. Yeah. Yes! Yes, you are! Yes! That's right, you're alive! Right, victory pose. Okay. Now, try the loser pose. If you don't believe me that this affects you, try this one. So this is loser pose. Shoulders down, crouching low. Look at that. What a bunch of losers. Yeah, look at that. Hey, losers. And the loser pose has demonstrated to increase levels of anxiety and depression. And if you don't believe me, here's, I have a suggestion. Walk around in the loser pose for about two or three days. Go to work, just walk around like this. Go to work for just about two or three days and see how you feel. That's the loser pose. Okay, now, I thought this was intriguing. There's a study that suggests, now they, did, they, did, they tricked people because they have to trick people, they have to be neutral in science, so they trick people into making this hand gesture without knowing why they were making it. And they found out that if you make this hand gesture, I, I could do it with two hands, like this. If you make that gesture, now you want to try it? You guys want to try it? See how you feel. Apparently you are more positively disposed to what you are looking at. So when you do this, you're like, yeah, that guy, is a, he's an okay speaker. Yeah, that's right, yeah. This is going okay. This night's going okay. Yes. And so the, what's interesting is that even if you don't know why you're making that gesture, your chemistry is affected to change you. That's what's weird about it. So I'm going to give you an example, though, of a more, a second pose that they studied. And I'd like you to make this gesture as well. It's a very intriguing one. Uh, you probably are familiar with it. Uh, this one. Yes. Now. What they discovered, they did the same thing. They tricked people into making uh, this gesture. They tricked them without knowing why, and they found out, of course, that you are more negatively disposed to what you are looking at or pointing at if you do this without even knowing why. So this is just an experiment. This is just a study, but I would like you to do this right now. All of you, if you could, even up in the balcony, if we could all do this together on the count of three, two, one. Yeah! Yeah! Losers! Yeah! Right. Now, did you notice that you were more like, I don't know if this is so interesting anymore. Okay, so now I want to show you another example of this phenomena. Uh, okay, actually, that was a demonstration. I just had that there in case somebody did not know how to make the gesture. Um, but now we're going to clear the air by making this one. This is a happy air-clearing gesture. It makes you happy, feel good. Excellent. So I want to show you something else, one last thing that's kind of intriguing. This is called skeptical eyes. And there's a study that shows that if you're watching a presentation, for example, and you hold artificially a more skeptical expression, so you're just faking it, because I know you wouldn't be doing that right now. You're just faking it. So if you don't mind, I ask you just to look at me very skeptically. Squint your eyes. Skeptical. And now here, I'll give you a, a, something to look at. So here's the Breakout Project Facebook banner. And now, look at it with skeptical eyes. And do you notice that you're wondering, hmm, what's that about? Why? You're more skeptical, even though this was an artificial experiment. So now I'll ask you to do something else. Try this expression. This is Captain Obvious. Eyes open, wide open, just a, just a very 
you know, arbitrary physical change, eyes wide open, same experiment. Now look at the banner, eyes wide open. Now how do you feel? Wow, pretty good. Pretty nice banner. Now, we'll take it even a step further. Eyes open, mouth open. Try it now. Oh, how do you feel about the banner now? Take a look. Is that not the greatest banner you have ever seen? That is simply your physiology manipulating your brain, which is very, very strange. Now, I don't want to take up too much time, so I want to show you something intriguing. The point of my talk tonight is that we often miss very, very obvious things, the very simple things. Uh, our own bodies, our own gestures, smiling, laughing, squinting, giving people the finger. All these things matter a lot. I want to show you an another demonstration of this. I was looking at this very Facebook banner. Oh. Sorry. I should wrap up first before I do that. So, to wrap up, I want to say our world has a lot of problems. Yes, climate change, poverty, depression, racism. We've got a lot of problems, but uh, that's obvious. And if we are willing to go directly, clearly, boldly, right at our problems, in my view, we're more likely to find solutions. So, I want to show you uh, that example I mentioned before. Uh, the banner. This is the banner. Now, I was looking at it while I was sort of setting this up, and I noticed something interesting. Hiding in plain sight. Take a look if you go closer. So, look at the gesture that's being made in this banner. It's a little bit like this. Try it. It's like a uh, hands up. I argue it's a victory pose plus applause. Victory pose, yeah! Plus applause, yay! Right? But wait, wait, look closer. What do you see over here? Aha, another pose. A very secret, underground, maybe subversive pose. Let's go a little bit closer. There it is. And so I think this, to me, embodies the spirit. If I can leave you with one message. Now, I'm just making this gesture. I don't know what it means. I'm just making this gesture to see how I feel. And I have some appropriate music. Yeah! Rock on, losers! Yeah! All right! Thank you very much! Yeah!